Uh, my name is Jan Altasar, and I'll be presenting my thesis on probabilistic modeling of structure in science, statistical physics to uh, recommender systems. So first, we'll be motivated by applied problems in science, such as computational drug discovery, where it's important to accurately model the interactions of many particles, whether in a drug or a large number of interacting particles. And it's important to build those assumptions about the interactions in that material into a statistical model, and then see how accurately that model enables you to reach your original goal of drug discovery or other large applied modeling problems. Next, we'll see another example of why it's important to use what you know about the data or the problem that you have, in this case, the ubiquitous problem of choosing what to eat every day, of food recommendation. And once again, we'll see why it's important to use what you know about individual data points, in this case, the foods in a meal, build those assumptions into a model, in this case, a classifier, and then evaluate and see how well you can get good downstream performance on the task that you care about. And last, we'll think about probabilistic modeling in general and study whether we can improve the previous two models simultaneously. In this case, we'll think about structure more broadly and structure in the probabilistic models themselves and think about how to include the structure in the optimization problem so constraints, building constraints on the probability distributions of the models, and see whether building such constraints leads to better performance on these two applied scientific tasks that we started off with. So first, think of your favorite applied machine learning problem, whether it's a large-scale drug discovery problem, such as finding drug candidates, such as this molecular dynamic simulation where the goal is to find new opioids that bind to pain receptors in the skin, or literally astronomically sized data, such as the simulation of the night sky, where astrophysicists might care about identifying the nature of photons hitting a light sensor on Earth. But my motivation in studying this uh, goes way back. So it actually starts with this statistical physics system, it's a frustrated magnet, and it's a potential way we might build quantum computers. This is a dysprosium titanate, so it has a rare earth element, dysprosium, that's represented by the blue dots at the corners of the tetrahedra. And this material is interesting because as dysprosium is a rare earth element, it has a large magnetic moment. So you can think of the blue spheres at the corners of the tetrahedra as magnets pointing into or out of each tetrahedron in this material. And the interactions between these little magnets uh, at the blue sphere locations, the interactions are what lead the material to behave in certain ways. And understanding how this material behaves in nature can let us control it, can let us, say, build better materials, and it's a great tool to use to study whether we can, say, use machine learning methods to help statistical physicists build better materials or understand their simulations in new ways. So how might a statistical physicist think about studying this material? First, they'll think about these magnets, the blue spheres, and then think about their interactions. And they'll write down a energy function, h of z, where z uh, is shorthand for the magnetic for the magnets. So whether the magnets at the blue spheres are pointing into or out of the tetrahedron, taking on values of plus or minus one, and the interactions in this material are encoded in the energy function. Um, there's a inverse temperature parameter beta, and this distribution is normalized. It's a probability distribution of what configuration you might find these atoms in if you go out into the world, find this material, and measure it. So we have this probability distribution that has certain assumptions encoded in the energy function about how these atoms interact with each other. What do we do next? From this probability distribution that is a model we are creating of this material, we can compute certain properties, such as the specific heat, or CV, the specific heat at a constant volume, 
And that's a function of the normalizing constant of this probability distribution. That's a model of this material. After we compute a pro property of this material that we can actually measure, we can compare it to the experimental value and see how well the assumptions that were made in constructing this model of the material line up with reality. This sounds great, but can we do it in practice? Actually, at the very first step, we're blocked. Why is that? Well, if you think about these little magnets at the blue spheres, they're pointing into or out of the tetrahedra. And so in order to normalize this probability distribution of random binary variables, we need to normalize over all possible configurations of these little magnets. And that means we need to compute an intractable sum, a sum over two to the n terms. And this is infeasible to do for most systems that we might want to study. So we're blocked at the very first step. What are our options? One thing we might wish to do is use Markov chain Monte Carlo. And this is a method to find likely configurations or samples that this material might be found in. And then we can use that to approximate quantities of interest, such as the specific heat or other functions of the normalizing constant of this probability distribution. But in this thesis, we'll use variational inference to learn an approximate distribution, Q of Z. And that'll be our approximation to the model that we care about studying. And with variational inference, we can complete this loop and we can see how well the approximate quantities that can be compared to experimental values line up with those experimental values. How does variational inference work? First, imagine this uh, white rectangle is the space of all probability distributions. And somewhere here is this model that we wish to study, P of Z, this model of this material. And because this model is intractable, we want to make certain assumptions, such as define an approximate family of distributions, Q of Z, a variational family that is simpler that we can use to make computations about the model that we care about, P of Z. So once we have a variational approximate family of distributions, Q of Z, parameterized by lambda, we can vary lambda and try to find a, an approximation that is closer and closer to the model that we care about, but that we can still make computations with. What do we mean by a model that is closer and closer? Uh, in variational inference, we typically use the Kullback-Leibler divergence, or the relative entropy between the approximate distribution Q of Z parameterized by lambda and the probabilistic model P of Z that we wish to study. So the recipe for variational inference is to first choose which model to study, P of Z, and then define this variational family of distributions, Q of Z parameterized by lambda, illustrated by this cartoon oval here, and then vary these parameters lambda. And the way to vary these parameters is constrained by the kullback leibler divergence. The Kale divergence is written as a relative entropy, so we have the negative entropy of the variational distribution, and then we have the model P of Z. So we have the inverse temperature parameter beta, the energy function encoding interactions of, for example, a material, and we have the normalizing constant. However, we can't compute this because of the normalizing constant that appears in the Kale divergence. So Z appears on the right-hand side. However, what we can do is bring this log normalizing constant to the other side and then use Jensen's inequality to compute a lower bound on the Kale divergence. And this lower bound, which is script L with parameters lambda, this is a log partition function lower bound, or elbow for short. We can take gradients of this objective function of the elbow and then maximize this lower bound and maximizing this lower bound on the log normalizing constant will lead to better and better approximate families of variational distributions, Q of Z parameterized by lambda, and get us closer to the distributions that we wish to study, P of Z. What's an example of a variational distribution that you can start off with? Uh, from statistical physics, 
uh, we can use a mean field variational family represented by this graphical model here. And in the mean field variational family, random variables z are fully factorized or independent. So they have no links between these nodes here in this graphical model. And it's a fully factorized distribution, so the distribution factors over all the random variables in this approximating family. However, we started off with the goal of modeling interacting systems. So we need to include interactions somehow if we want to minimize the distance sufficiently to answer questions that we care about. So how do we include additional information in this variational family? We can uh, use work on building hierarchical variational models. And this is inspired by um, hierarchical probabilistic modeling, where we start off with this mean field variational family that we saw in the last slide. And then we can place priors on the variational parameters lambda. And this is one way of encoding additional structure into a variational inference family. And if you remember in the cartoon diagram of that oval, this is one way of increasing the size of that oval in the hopes that we can find better and better variational families by varying the parameters lambda to get closer to the model that we wish to study. So the distribution corresponding to the hierarchical variational model is a mean field family represented by the fully factorized distribution Q of zi conditional on lambda i. And then we have the variational prior, Q of lambda parameterized by parameters theta. And we integrate this over the variational parameters. However, the whole motivation for doing this in the first place was an intractable integral, or we weren't able to compute the normalizing constant over all possible configurations of random variables. And what do we have in this equation? We have a intractable integral. It's over all of the latent variables, and so in a large system, it will also be difficult to compute. However, if you like uh, computing lower bounds as much as I do, you'll be pleased to note that you can apply uh, the variational inference trick again and compute a lower bound on this lower bound and do variational inference twice by introducing a recursive variational posterior or recursive approximation to the variational posterior. And the recursive approximation is written R of lambda conditional on Z with parameters phi. And we've essentially done variational inference again in driving this bound. And now we have two sets of parameters two sets of parameters to vary. First, we have the parameters of the variational prior, theta, and then we have the parameters of the recursive approximation, phi. And so by doing variational inference twice, essentially, computing a lower bound on this intractable lower bound, we have an objective function that we can use to tune the variational parameters and see how well we can fit to the statistical model, physics models that we wish to study. How do we construct a hierarchical variational model that is sufficiently flexible enough, it ha that has enough information about the interactions between random variables? We can use tools from uh, generative modeling, such as normalizing flows. Normalizing flows are a flexible class of generative models. They start off with a base density, in this case a standard normal distribution, and then they compute transformations of that base density using neural networks. What this does is it transforms the base density into a more complicated distribution. And in order for this to remain tractable, there are certain requirements that a normalizing flow imposes on these transformations. First, they must be invertible because that lets us compute the density. And for scalability, we want these, uh, density, tra these density computations to be cheap. So for example, we might impose a lower triangular log determinant Jacobian requirement. So then the uh, density is, remains cheap to compute even for large systems of random variables. In statistical physics, these models are starting to become used, like in this great physical review letters paper from 2019, where uh, Wu et al used variational autoregressive networks. These are convolutional neural networks that build on generative models such as normalizing flows and get very good performance in statistical physics tasks. And this is what we'll be comparing to later on once we see how to build hierarchical variational models using normalizing flows.
So to construct a hierarchical variational model, we'll start off with a classical statistical physics model, the Ising model. This is one model, say, to study the material that we were interested in originally. It has uh, binary random variables on the nodes, and the edges denote interactions between these random variables. We can introduce a variational likelihood, Q of lambda, with parameters theta. And then we can introduce the recursive approximation in order to compute every uh, quantity in the hierarchical variational model's objective function. And next, we want to think about what structure is in the Ising model that we can exploit. What knowledge do we have about this probabilistic graphical model that will let us imbue additional knowledge and enlarge that cartoon figure of the variational families and get us closer to approximating this model well? Consider the central node in the Ising model on the left. So this central node has four nearest neighbors. These are denoted by uh, shaded nodes. And this is the Markov blanket of this node. By conditioning on the nearest neighbors, then you render the central node independent of the rest of the graph. So essentially, you can know all there is to know about a node if you know the value of its four nearest neighbors. We can use this to our advantage by taking ideas from normalizing flows and using convolutions that only include information from the nearest neighbors of a central node in the Ising model, and then use that convolutional filter to go over the entire model to get a scalable approximation. And we can construct the recursive approximation in a similar way. We can use normalizing flows, use a convolutional architecture, and then the convolutional kernel can be specified so that every node only uses information about its nearest neighbors. And this is deep learning territory, so we can stack these transformations and see if that leads to a boost in performance. So how well does this work for approximating an icing model? So the benchmark that we'll use is look at, looking at the free energy. The free energy is a quantity that is inversely proportional to the variational lower bound, so it means lower is better. And the free energy is one example of a physical quantity that we might use to compare to experimental values. And so for an icing model with about a thousand random variables, we can see that this variational autoregressive network approach from the physical review letters paper of last year, it works better than a hierarchical variational model. So are we done? Can we get, have we done anything useful? Uh, let's see what happens when we increase the number of random variables in this icing model. Well, we see that here assumptions start to matter. So if you think of the meaning of the variational autoregressive network, autoregressivity means that every random variable must be conditioned on every previous random variable that was drawn from a variational distribution. And this leads to a complexity that scales with the square of the number of random variables in the model. And this means that with a fixed computational budget, it'll be very difficult to fit variational autoregressive networks to large systems of interacting atoms. And now let's see what happens if we increase the number of random variables further to a million. We can see that because we imbued the structure of the statistical physics model into our variational approximation, we're able to scale to systems with millions of random variables with uh, many fewer parameters and in a much shorter time than this competing method. And the really interesting question here is, can we fix this gap? So you see there's a gap between the exact solution computed with theory and the approximations that we're able to build that are scalable. And this remains an open problem, and I think it's very interesting to think about settings such as uh, drug discovery or protein folding, where you need to scale to systems with millions or even billions of random variables, but you might wish to trade off the accuracy of those simulations in order to answer questions that you care about. So we saw how to imbue the structure of the icing model into a variational approximation. Let's see if this carries over into other statistical physics models. The Sherrington Kirkpatrick model is another statistical physics model, but in this case, nearest neighbors are connected 
And in addition, every node is connected to every other node. So this is a fully connected probabilistic graphical model. Again, we can look at the free energy, and we see that for systems with a few thousand random variables, now the hierarchical variational models are more accurate. This is interesting because this model is very hard to model. It's fully connected, and so our assumptions are incorrect here. We started off with uh, a convolutional kernel and the normalizing flows in our variational approximation, and this assumption is not true anymore because it's a fully connected probabilistic graphical model. But we can see that our approach generalizes to this more difficult setting and gives us better performance than a variational autoregressive network. And we can increase the number of random variables again, and once again we see that we can scale to a much larger system sizes in a shorter amount of time, in this case with significantly more accuracy. And the number of parameters is also interesting to consider. In the variational autoregressive network, there's about 700,000 parameters, while in the hierarchical variational model, all the parameters you really need are the convolutional kernel. And so we only used 5,000 parameters, which is 100 times parameter savings, to get better performance. Another way to illustrate this is by looking at the number of iterations needed, or the number of stochastic gradient ascent steps needed to optimize the variational lower bound. And once again, we can see that on a logarithmic scale, we only need to even one second for systems with millions of random variables. So have we achieved our goal? Uh, partly, because we are able to scale the larger systems with more accuracy sometimes, but there's no general answer. I think it depends on the problem that you're studying. And this leads to several directions for future work, such as using hierarchical variational models that can scale to large systems as proposals for accurate Monte Carlo methods which might help reduce burn-in time. Uh, I'm also uh, excited to be collaborating on problems in drug screening, where it's important to include more and more quantum interactions. And another interesting observation in this work is that Rao blackalization, or controlling the variance of the gradients of the stochastic gradient ascent steps, uh, increases the accuracy. And so there's a lot of work to be done on making these lower bounds on the log partition function tighter. And in the later part of this talk, we'll also see how um, additional structure about the probability distributions during optimization with proximity variational inference can also increase the accuracy. Jan? Yes. Can you go back uh, one slide? Sure. Uh, the one before this one. Yeah, I'm just curious um, how, so you have time per iteration, but what, can you give a feel for how long the entire process takes? I mean, how many sure. iterations? So I think this is helpful to see on this. Um, we can work backward to answer that question from this so we can see where convergence happens. And so within about 10 minutes, you can see that the hierarchical variational model approach converges. So there's marginal improvements in the objective function within about 10 minutes to half an hour. Right. But then the, the one with the larger number of parameters takes longer. Exactly. There's different assumptions in the variational family that lead to scaling in the quadratic number of random variables. Yeah, that, that was my next question. It's usually quadratic dependence, right? So, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Sure. And so what have we seen so far? We started off with an applied goal of scaling to large systems with interacting particles, such as in statistical physics or drug screening. And then we saw why it was important to consider the structure of the probabilistic models, build those assumptions into a variational approximation. And then we saw how it got us one step closer to the goal of scaling to systems with millions of interacting random variables. Next, we'll look at the ubiquitous problem of choosing what to eat every day. And we'll see that a similar process lets us get good performance on the supplied task, and why it's important to consider the structure of individual data points in this case, and infuse that structure into a machine learning method. So the motivation for this work is really walking into a grocery store. When I go grocery shopping, I'm overwhelmed by images like this. I have a long shopping list of things I want to try, but it's hard to know what to do because I want to try everything. 
And at the same time, while I want to try everything I want to explore, I also want to exploit. This is an image of my mum's fridge over the holidays. And like any good Estonian fridge, it has a uh, heavy cream, it has sauerkraut, pickled herring, uh, rosolia, bacon. And so there's this tension at play here between exploration and finding new things to enjoy and enjoying what you already know you enjoy. And the challenge for a machine learning method here is balancing these two goals. But before we see how to solve this problem, I'd like to tell you a story with the help of uh, Pixar. And specifically, Emma Coates, who's the storyboard artist for uh, some great Pixar movies. Once upon a time, there was matrix factorization. Matrix factorization is a recommendation system, or one, a recommendation model that can be used to build a recommender system. And the way it works is this. You start off with data of user item interactions, such as this character who watched the movie Up, and then this other character, the heart, who watched the movie Brave. And you might have information about the items to be recommended. In this case, if you go on imdb.com, the Internet Movie Database, you'll see that Emma Coates was a storyboard artist for both of these movies. Next, we can do a singular value decomposition and approximate this matrix with a lower rank decomposition of latent parameters representing users, preferences, items, and item attributes. And then we can use inner products between rows and columns of these matrices respectively to try to impute and predict the values of what would happen if a user saw this movie. Would they enjoy it or not? Every day, a new matrix factorization model appears because it's a great method and it works really, really well for many things that we use every day. This is, uh, to give you context, one of my favorite papers uh, by uh, Hu et al. It's been cited every day since it was published. And I'm more than happy to contribute to these citations and build matrix factorization methods myself. So this is a model that works really well and it is fun to use. I highly recommend it. However, one day, recall was used for evaluation. What does it mean to evaluate a recommendation model with recall? First, consider items to be recommended as colored squares, and consider the sh shaded squares to denote items a user has already clicked on or has already consumed. Next, consider a recommendation model, the probability of a user U consuming an item M, and you can think of YUM as the data that was collected, so whether user U watched movie M. We can use the probabilities that a recommendation model predicts to rank these items to be recommended and to reorder this list of items that we have in our database. Next, we can fix a threshold, such as three in this case, and then count how many true positives or items that a user actually consumed, did the recommendation model rank above this threshold of three? In this case, recall is two thirds. So recall or the true positive, or the fraction of true positives returned by the recommendation model is a great way to evaluate recommender systems. But what that means is that zero worst case error classifiers are optimal. That's a mouthful, so let's unpack that a little bit. What is, this, what is the worst case error for a binary classifier y hat taking as arguments user u and item m? The worst case error, you can compute it by looking at where the data points predicted by your classifier and in the actual data uh, represented by calligraphic d here differ. So you can look at your data y, you can look at your predictions y hat and look at where they differ and then take the maximum of where they differ, and that'll be your worst case error for your binary classifier. And what does this worst case error of a binary classifier mean for recall? Think about how we computed recall. In this example, recall was two thirds, and the worst case error is greater than zero because there's a shaded square below items that a user consumed, which are above the threshold. And now think about computing recall for 
a binary classifier with zero worst case error, where a binary classifier ranks every item a user consumed above every item a user did not consume. In this case, the zero worst case error is uh, zero. It's in the name. And this connection between binary classification and the recommendations, recommender system evaluation metric of recall is useful because it may or may not exist for the matrix factorization method. And because of this connection, binary classifiers outperform matrix factorization in practice when evaluated on recall. And we'll see by how significantly in a bit. And so finally, I now think twice before dismissing the humble binary classifier as a recommendation model. Here I am uh, pondering recommendation problems. So where have we been so far? So far, we connected the recommender system evaluation metric of recall to binary classification, but our original goal was food recommendation systems. And so the missing piece here is how do we build the structure of data points? In this case, self-report dietary recommendation, dietary behavior data. How do we build the, build that knowledge about the data into a binary classification system to solve the problem of food recommendation systems? So the data that we'll consider is self-report data. So users might type into an app what they ate. Somebody might eat breakfast pizza with coffee. Somebody might eat a sardine taco, uh, but it's probably me. So uh, the data of user item interactions, if you remember from the matrix factorization, we want to think about which items a user consumed. In this case, users consume meals. And those meals have metadata. In this case, they're attributes or foods in the meals that the users type in and report they ate. And one important thing to note is that we can permute the columns of this metadata matrix, and it won't change the information in it. So whether you tell me you ate pizza, eggs, and then coffee, or coffee, eggs, and then pizza, it shouldn't change what I know about your meal. Or think about a hamburger with reordering the uh, elements of the hamburger. And so how do we use this structure in the data in a binary classification method that we know works well if recall is a metric that we might care about in recommendation systems? Well, we can turn to deep learning and we can build the rank from sets. Um, so this is a recommendation model that uses information about a user U, a meal M or item M, and uses, it, uses that information to predict whether or not a user consumes that meal or finds it yummy. And with the deep learning toolkit that we have, we can parameterize this binary classifier in several different ways. So the neural network F that takes as input information about a user U and the set of foods in a meal XM can be parameterized, uh, for example, as an inner product or a log linear embedding model, where we have user embeddings, theta U, these are learned parameters, and then we have a permutation and variance sum of attribute embeddings, representing embeddings um, of the foods in, the, in a meal, for example. And why is there a sum here? This sum is important because it respects the structure of the data. It respects the permutation and variance in that metadata matrix of data that we had collected. And we'll see later on how we can use that theoretically. Next, in this log linear embedding model that's used to parameterize our binary classifier, we have item embeddings. These take as input the set of item attributes and are also permutation invariant. And we have item intercepts. What are other choices of parameterizing this binary classification-based recommendation model? We just saw the inner product parameterization. We can think about a neural network, phi, um, that takes as input a user embedding and the sum of item embeddings. This is interesting to consider in contrast to the inner product model because a priori it's not clear that a neural network can represent an inner product. And that's because nowhere in a neural network do two input features get cross multiplied. And finally, we can combine these models. We can take the inner product model and then learn the residual error with a neural network phi. 
and this is motivated by ResNets or residual networks for image recognition. And so why might it be important to respect the structure in the data in this applied problem? Well, we can use it to prove a, uh, a simple property that in the infinite data limit, then a binary classifier such as rank from sets can approximate any other order invariant model. So take a model F with information about a user U and item XM. If that model is invariant to the attributes or the elements of XM, then a binary classifier such as rank from sets can exactly approximate its output. It's not clear how useful this type of property is, but it's nice motivation. And this is based on work from uh, Zahir et al. So what this is saying that if you have a neural network that's making recommendations, then given enough data and compute, then it can approximate the output of other permutation invariant models, such as matrix factorization, or even more complex models, such as recurrent neural networks marginalized over permutations of the input. So now that we've built our binary classification model, rank from sets to perform recommendations, how do we fit it? How do we uh, train these parameters on data? It's binary classification, so the goal is to separate the yum from the yuck. So positive examples, yum, um, are trained to be separated from yuk, items the user did not consume in the training data. And the binary classifier has parameters gamma, and these might be the user embeddings, the food embeddings, or the weights and biases of a neural network. There's one subtlety here, which is the parameter lambda u. This is a parameter that's used to balance the positive and negative examples, because in this type of implicit feedback data, if users are only telling us what they ate, not what they didn't eat, then the number of negative examples is enormous. That's because most people don't eat most things, myself included. Oh, uh, Jan? Yes. Yeah, I was uh, waiting to see if it was going to be on this page, but um, I had a question again on the log linear. Sure. Because um, I, I don't have a good f intuitive feel for this, but I, I know, you know, in other contexts, you know, what it, what it means to have log normal versus log linear versus log something else. So can you just put in words what the significance of using log linear? Sure. So this is... Um, I think it's uh, I think of it as one way to build a function that not that lets your data interact nonlinearly. So there might be nonlinear dependence between, say, whether a user eats like this, a vegetarian meals sometimes or non-vegetarian meals sometimes, conditional on certain properties of the foods or the meals. And in order to capture such nonlinearities, then you can think of what functions other than a linear model might capture those nonlinearities or patterns in the data. And this is another way to think about it is a shallow neural network or a one hidden layer neural network where the only nonlinearity is a sigmoid function, sigma, after computing the uh, inner product between the user embedding and then the sum of embeddings. And so I think of this as one choice among many and in terms of further motivation, you are including nonlinear effects in, in between the different. Yes, exactly. So these are all examples of nonlinear functions that can learn patterns in the data that may not be linearly dependent. Okay, thanks. Sure. And so we have a recommendation model. We know how to train it. Uh, let's see how well it works, because we saw how to take what we know about recommendation models, um, which is that binary classifiers work well for recall. We imbued the structure of individual data points or self-report dietary behavior data into a binary classifier ranked from sets. And let's see whether we can balance the original goal of balancing exploration with exploitation. And the specific data set that we'll use to solve this problem comes from the Lose It app. This is an app with uh, a large number of users. And so this is an example of the scale of data that we're working with here. On the x-axis is the number of attributes or the number of foods in a meal. And the count is the number of times users 
eight meals with the, that number of attributes. And so we have one year's worth of data from 55,000 users of this app. That's about 15 million meals. And the item attributes are about 10,000 foods that users can type into this app to report what they ate to try to lose weight. Some examples of the meals are, say, breakfast meals with green tea and cereal, or more complex meals such as roast pork with mackerel. And in order to evaluate a recommendation model on this size of data, because we have 15 million meals, we can't compute recall or the fraction of true positives returned by the recommendation model efficiently. This is because for every user, we need to re-rank 15 million different meals in the data set. And so what we can do is use a scalable evaluation metric or a sampled recall. And the way this works is that for every item uh, that is held out that the recommendation model hasn't seen before, we can sample negatively labeled items or items that user, a user has not consumed from other users in the data. So if a user, say, holding the heart, has consumed the uh, items in the shaded squares, then we can sample negative labels or negatively labeled items from other users in the training data, and then calculate recall on this much smaller set of items. And this is a common technique in recommender systems. So with this metric, let's see how well we can solve this problem of food recommendation. We can compare to prior work, such as probabilistic matrix factorization methods, such as collaborative topic Poisson factorization, which uses variational inference to maximize a lower bound on the observed data. We can also compare to embedding models, such as Starspace, which is what Facebook uses to make recommendations. We can compare to a long short-term memory net recurrent neural network, or an LSTM model, and marginalize its inputs over the um, permutations of item of attributes in the items to preserve the order invariance property we want. And we can also build a word embedding model to compare against, where a uh, meal might be represented as the average of the food embeddings in it, and a user might be represented as the average of the meals they have eaten in terms of embeddings. So how well does this work in comparison to these competitive models? We can see that it works a lot better, and this is good empirical verification of the simple result that if recall is something that you care about, binary classification is a good choice, and you might want to use rank from sets. And you can see that even for, um, say, state-of-the-art models such as collaborative topic Poisson factorization, they may not be trained to directly optimize recall. And so this leads to an interesting trade-off. It depends what your goal is. If your goal is only recall, then you might want to use rank from sets. But if your goal might be something else, such as qualitatively exploring patterns in the data, you might want to think about, uh, say, probabilistic latent variable models such as CTPF. So it really depends on the goals. But nevertheless, can we see if we can get some qualitative results out of this model, even though it was trained to uh, hopefully maximize recall? We can look at uh, nearest neighbors in embedding space. So we can look at a query meal, such as this breakfast meal with uh, green tea and large banana, large strawberries. And we can look at its nearest neighbor in terms of cosine distance over all the 15 million meals in the training data. And we can find its nearest neighbor to be another breakfast meal with large fried whole egg. We can also look at salads, uh, for example, this uh, Iceberg lettuce-based salad with dry-cooked, unsalted, hulled sunflower seed kernels. And we're, we can compute its nearest neighbor to be this green leaf lettuce-based salad with oil-roasted, salted sunflower seeds. So maybe the model's picking up on sunflower seeds. But it's interesting to know that even though we built this model for performance, we can still use it to understand patterns in the data. Next, we can think about whether we can use rank from sets for other tasks, such as the ubiquitous problem of uh, choosing what to read every day. And in this case, if you're like me, then you'll be shopping for food at the grocery store while browsing the archive to stay up to date on the latest and greatest matrix factorization recommendation models. So we can look at this large data set from the archive.org preprint repository 
we can look at one year of data from 65,000 users and about a half a million papers. And the data is very different because the items have more attributes associated with them. In this case, the item attributes are the words in an abstract of a scientific preprint. And again, we can see whether rank from sets is competitive with alternative methods. And we can calculate recall and precision in this case, because this is how the uh, alternate model we're comparing against, collaborative topic Poisson factorization, was evaluated with. And we can look at in matrix and out matrix items. In matrix are items with clicks in the training data. So these are papers that scientists have read on the archive. And out matrix items are items with no clicks in the training data. So items where all you have to go off of to predict whether somebody will like it is the, say, 100 or so words in the article abstract. And again, we can see that the theory plays out in practice, that in terms of recall, we can outperform these other methods sometimes by a large margin, such as, uh, say, for the top 100 recommendations, we're almost at 10% performance for in-matrix articles. And that's pretty good, considering we have a half a million articles uh, to rank. In terms of precision, the results are, are a little more mixed. But again, we get quite good performance. And we can also see if we can find qualitative patterns in this data. And we can... Uh, say, look at a projection of the user embeddings in the inner product parametrization of rank from sets, and then look at a 2D representation of all 65,000 users in the training data. And interesting patterns emerge here, and it's nice to, and one thing to know to interpret this uh, projection correctly is that every point is a user, and then users are colorized according to their most read archive category. So if I mostly read, say, math.st or statistics on the top, or cs.ds, uh, data science, then I'll be represented as a dot with that color. And so in terms of nearest neighbors, it's nice to see that scientists who read together uh, are projected into similar spaces, such as stat.ml being close to statistics, and those fields share methods. And similarly, on the right-hand side, um, in physics, we can see that math.gg, or differential geometry, is close to HEP theory, or HEP hyphen TH, or high energy physics theory. And again, those, field, those fields share methods. So it's nice to know that we can get good performance and qualitative results from rank from sets. And then what, it's, sorry for sure. looking at the map in detail, but how, would, how do you um, explain a, an island, like in the, just below the HEP theory? and sort of in the region of HEP X, HEP PH, there, there's sort of an island. And I'm just wondering what this, what's the physical interpretation of, or the, the interpretation of that gap. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I think to answer that question, I would need to think about the projection algorithm, which is t-distributed stochastic neighbor embeddings. So this algorithm makes assumptions about the distribution of the values of, say, the vectors representing the users, and then does uh, non-convex optimization to find a two-dimensional representation of these high-dimensional points. So it's unclear whether it's an artifact in the projection method or actually relates to patterns in the data. So I guess I would think about looking at all the users in that island and then seeing who are their nearest neighbors in cosine space, for example, or seeing if there are actual gaps in the reading patterns of those scientists. Because right now it's a little hard to say, but it is fun to, say, look at the full version that I linked to and then zoom in and try to find patterns or find yourself even. I'm just kidding. This is, the, this is anonymous. And I'm assuming there's another field to this kind of technique, but it, it's, you don't have to flatten it to 2D also, right? You could, you could, in principle, make a 3D version of this? We could make a 3D version. It just depends on which projection algorithm you wish to use. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. What have we seen so far? We started off with an applied problem. We saw how to build structure in that problem into a variational inference method. And then we completed this cycle of applied machine learning again, where we saw how it was important to consider the goals of the problem, in this case, food recommendation, and the structure of individual data points, and imbue both those sources of prior knowledge into a machine learning method to get good downstream performance. 
And for the last part of this thesis, let's think about how to think about probabilistic modeling more generally. So how do we improve both of these models that we built at the same time? How do we take this structure of the probabilistic models themselves and then use that knowledge to improve optimization methods and get more accurate solutions in the machine learning tasks that we care about? So one, one thing you could think about to add structure about a probability distribution represented by this bell curve here is, say, general statistics of probability distributions. And so in this last part, we'll see how to build constraints on probability distributions and use those constraints to improve the accuracy of those probabilistic modeling methods. So why might a constraint be helpful in a probabilistic modeling um, setting? To understand why constraints might be helpful, let's think about a case where things break, such as in this Bernoulli factor model. In this Bernoulli factor model, then we have latent variables zik, and we have data points xi. The latent variables zik represent which clusters the data point is associated with, and the data points are normally distributed with means given by the inner product between these, say, cluster identity latent variables and the cluster mean parameters mu. And our goal here might be to infer the cluster mean parameter mu. And so what do I mean by things break? Well, we can see what happens when we try to fit, uh, fit this model using variational inference. So find an approximate posterior distribution for the latent variable z and use variational expectation maximization to infer the correct cluster mean parameters or infer the ground truth that we know ahead of time. So visually, it might look like this, where in the center of the screen, the red dot represents the true parameters in this Bernoulli factor analysis model and the green arrowheads represent one iteration of variational inference that is used to infer something about this probabilistic method. And what we're looking at is the cluster mean parameters. And so if our goal is to correctly infer the ground truth, so get the green dots and the green arrows to converge to the ground truth during optimization, um, so through the convergence of variational inference, uh, we can think about why the green dots do not get to the ground truth. And that's because variational inference uh, is a non-convex problem typically, so the log partition function lower bound is a non-convex objective function, and variational inference can get stuck. So if the parameters are not initialized correctly, say if we don't initialize these mean parameters in this Bernoulli factor analysis model to be very close to the true parameters, then the optimization might get stuck and the successive steps of stochastic gradient ascent might not lead to improvements in how accurate our solutions are in the end. Sorry, Jan, I might have missed something. Sure. In, this, in the true model, the two means are both zero. Can you go back to the model for a sec? Yep. And so you're saying the true yeah, can you, can you relate this hierarchical model to the next plot? So I understand this. We have a mixture of two normals, right? Sure. And so here go in back, red... Go back for one second, Jan. Go back yep. for one second. Z is zero, 1. Oh, I see. So Z is a zero, 1 vector. So there's like a latent vector, of a latent binary vector for every data point. Yeah, exactly. Data points can belong to multiple clusters because they can have multiple ones on, right? Yeah. Yeah, great. So I understand this. Can you relate this to the next? Go to the next plot. Sure. So here we can fix the ground truth parameters, so the cluster mean parameters, so two numbers to be, say, close to the origin. So they're both zero or close to zero? They're close to zero. So let's say I think it was like minus 6.2, for example, for one dimension. But they're both the same. They're not too different. No, they're both, they're both different. So I think the, yeah, they're, they're, both, they're not the same value. All right. If they're close to each other, you, you, it's hard to, to estimate them because yep. there's too many explanations. But anyway, okay, I understand. So, so it's true. They are both close to each other. And then the green, 
it's the estimated mu via variational EM. Exactly. Thank you, Jan. Sure. And so if you think about the optimization trajectory of variational inference, then the gradient ascent steps get stuck at the green dots. So those green dots represent places where variational inference got stuck and could not get to the truth. And so we'll see how to use what knowledge we have about this probability distribution here, whether it's the Bernoulli or the normal, to include additional structure into the optimization algorithm and see how that fixes this problem. So how we can correctly infer the ground truth in this model and in other models that we studied in the first parts of this thesis. And the way we'll do this is construct a notion of proximity. So think about what it means for two gradient ascent steps to push or pull successive iterates of parameters further or uh, closer from each other. And we'll start off uh, in constructing this definition of proximity by thinking about traditional gradient ascent, which uses Euclidean distance in an interesting way. So one way to derive gradient ascent is to write down an update equation u, which is uh, the solution. So if you optimize the update equation, then you'll have found the, great, the next step in your gradient ascent algorithm. And the way to write down this update equation to derive gradient ascent is to consider a first order Taylor expansion of your objective function, script L, with parameters lambda t, so the previous iterates of the parameters that you're optimizing. And so this first order Taylor expansion of your objective function looks like this. The first term is the value of the objective function at the previous iterate. And then the next term is the gradient multiplied by the difference between the uh, first, the current iterate of the parameters and the previous one. And next, we'll add a Euclidean distance constraint on the parameters. So this is an L2 ball around the parameters that you're optimizing. And this is represented by this circle in this diagram. And the size of this circle is constrained by the parameter rho, which is the uh, step size of your gradient descent algorithm. So this is the update equation. And if you solve this, you'll see that it has a tractable solution. The solution to this update equation is gradient ascent. So the solution of lambda t plus one, your next iterates will be lambda t plus the step size times the gradient. However, we saw that using gradient ascent in variational inference leads to issues if parameters are not initialized correctly, which can often happen in high dimensions where knowing what it means for parameters to be close or far is difficult. So we can think about deforming this Euclidean ball around the parameters using knowledge about probability distributions or using structure of the problem, once again. And so to write down a proximity variational inference update equation, we can start off with this uh, update equation for gradient ascent. So this is the first order Taylor expansion around the current iterates of the parameter subject to this Euclidean constraint. And then we can deform this constraint with a distance function. And to understand what it means to deform this Euclidean ball, uh, Euclidean ball constraint that is implicit in uh, gradient ascent, then you can think about, um, say, a proximity statistic f of lambda. So this is some function that relates to the probability distribution that you're optimizing with parameters lambda. And then you can think about how um, that statistic might vary over time. So for example, the entropy of a probability distribution might greatly change or grow, even though the parameters of that probability distribution might remain close together within the Euclidean ball of gradient descent. And the rest of the parameters in this constraint, in this proximity constraint that we're adding to the update equation of gradient ascent are the magnitude k and then the distance d. So we can choose the distance function to be Euclidean. Uh, we can choose other distances, uh, and those might be problem dependent. And so what are examples of knowledge that we have about probability distributions that might be beneficial in optimization and might help us avoid the poor local optima that we saw in the Bernoulli factor analysis model? 
Some examples of proximity statistics f with parameters lambda that we might wish to constrain during subsequent gradient ascent steps are the mean or the variance of the distribution, the entropy of the distribution, or in a probabilistic graphical model, the KL divergence between the current approximation and the prior distribution. And there's a wide variety of choices here, and it's interesting to think of what choice of proximity statistic might lead to a beneficial constraint during optimization. So we already saw that choosing proximity statistics correctly can help optimization, can help variational inference escape poor local optima. In this case, in the Bernoulli factor analysis model, we constrain the gradient as ascent steps to remain close in terms of the entropy of the variational distribution, and this prevented the binary random variables to uh, collapse too quickly. This prevented the collapse of the binary variables to low entropy solutions during optimization. That was the issue in variational inference. We can also see whether proximity variational inference helps in more complicated problems, such as the sigmoid belief network, where again we see that an entropy constraint on the gradient ascent steps leads to more accurate estimates of the log partition function lower bound, or the elbow. In this case, it's fit to the uh, modified uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology handwritten digits database, and we can also get better estimates of the likelihood um, of those handwritten digits. And we can also see whether using this type of knowledge about probability distributions during optimization can help the previous two parts of this thesis, where we built models for statistical physics and recommender systems. In the case of the icing model, then enforcing that gradient ascent steps remain close in terms of the entropy leads to improved estimates of the free energy. So once again, building knowledge about the structure of the problem, in this case, the knowledge that we have is that the entropy of successive gradient ascent steps of the variational approximations should remain close, leads to more accurate solutions or better estimates of this physical quantity, the free energy in a statistical physics model. We can also apply proximity constraints to maximum likelihood estimation problems, such as the meal recommendation task, because again, we're dealing with a probability model or a model of what items users are likely to interact with. So we can look at the entropy of that distribution of the probability of a user interacting with an item and then use a proximity constraint on the entropy of that distribution during optimization and then show that it leads to a, a boost in performance in terms of recall. Similarly, on the archive task of recommendation, we see that enforcing that the entropy change minimally during successive gradient ascent steps can improve the recall, and this is for outmatrix items, so items that do not have clicks in the training data. So there's lots of exciting future work here, which is, say, using combinations of the approaches that we built in this thesis, so building new proximity constraints that might be specific to statistical physics methods or specific to recommendation models, and we saw this cycle from the start of starting off with an applied task, thinking about how structure helps, getting better performance, uh, next considering a food recommender systems problem, considering the goal of, a pro of the problem, which is accurate recommendation or good performance in terms of recommender recall. And last, we saw how to improve both of those methods by considering what properties of the probabilistic models themselves might be useful in optimization and might lead to more accurate solutions in studying those probabilistic models and answering scientific questions. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Jan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, so, I, I, as you know, I work in the physics of cancer, uh, and there's literally hundreds of cancer drugs uh, out there. And as far as I can tell, every um, doctor has a, a set of a few drugs he uses, mm -hmm. uh, and everyone has different sets of drugs they use. Uh, and I don't think there's any sort of um, 
mathematical approach that they use is simply seat of the pants kinds of things. It's a little like your recommender network. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the problem here is, I think, is there's actually a result from using the drugs, right? You could have, use your mathematics here, I guess, and have the uh, uh, doctors uh, interact with one another in that way. But I don't see down the road the consequence of the choices that are being made. How would you include that in this? Because ultimately it actually, in this area, has a consequence. Uh, how would that be embedded into your model? That's a, that's a great question, and that's, that's a topic of my, my postdoc, actually. So how to build probabilistic models that, say, include cause and effect into models. So say if you treat somebody with a drug, you don't know what confounders, you can't measure the confounders. So for example, socioeconomic status, you don't know how that might affect that person's response to a drug treatment. And so I think it relies again on building the structure of the problem into a probabilistic model. In this case, what assumptions can you make about those confounders? And say, if you have a natural experiment, like unfortunately this pandemic, then will that let you make new or different assumptions about how people respond to drugs? Or can you remove the effects of those confounders by understanding whether they add randomness in a beneficial way, such as a proxy for a randomized controlled trial? So, but, but uh, yes, that's, I understand that. So that's what you're going to be working on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but is there any, uh, anything in your thesis that addresses this, or is this a, a new territory for you? I think it's, I've worked on a related problem, which is, say, predicting patient readmission to hospitals. And this uses a binary classification technique because it's a binary problem of does a patient return to a hospital or not? That's similar to, say, the prediction of is this drug, will this drug cause death or not? Or will it lead to an, a readmission or not to a hospital? And I think we can use, say, structure about the problem to inform the probabilistic modeling choices we make. And I think it's a great question for future work, such as if you know certain things about confounders or patients in your cohorts that you're studying or treating with drugs A and B, then can you enforce that your gradient ascent steps remain close in terms of those latent properties of your patients or, say, between treatment and control groups? And so that's one example of, say, building a new proximity constraint using knowledge that you have about, say, assumptions of your treatment and control groups, and then building a probabilistic model that preserves those properties during optimization to get, say, better estimates of, say, the efficacy of a cancer treatment. Thank you. So I had another general question. Um, so these techniques, uh, at least in my limited experience, they're either designed to do better uh, or be safer <laughs> or some some adjective like that. And I, at least in the last few slides, maybe I'm misreading it, but it seemed that the performance difference was was small. But it was it, is it more significant than it appears? And is the was the goal here to have a better performing um, algorithm, or was it? Uh, are there other benefits that I missed in terms of the differences between what you were doing and what other people have done? That's a great point. The last few slides were more to illustrate that these methods work in tandem. So. Well, we saw, say, large performance boosts in the first two parts of the thesis. Say we scaled to models, like icing models with millions of interacting random variables, or we scaled to, say, a data set with 15 million meals with state-of-the-art performance in the second part of the thesis. The last part was more to illustrate that you can, use, you can build machine learning methods more, more generally and then use structure about the probabilistic models themselves to get a slight boost in performance. And I think it's really paving the way for future research of, sure, the performance increase was small, but the original performance increase, say, from going to a model that scales quadratically in the number of random variables to a model that scales much more efficiently to systems with millions of random variables. And just to illustrate that you can get further boost in performance with the plug-and-play method, where all you do is you add one line to your code of saying, constrain my gradient ascent steps to 
um, say, limit the entropy difference in successive iterates of my variational distribution during optimization and show that you can build general methods or you can build, say, methods tailored to a problem such as statistical physics and then get performance benefits from both and that the combination is more powerful, so the is greater than the sum of the parts. Thank you. Oh, hey, Jan. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a question also about the recommendation system, which is very interesting, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and I start to think about more like reputation systems in uh, financial, let's say, uh, environments. Um, so yeah, you can collect data, let's say, from the system or the network, train your model, and then get recommendations uh, regarding, for example, which part to deal with. And it is kind of related to the question about the um, cancer medication, uh, whether you will consider uh, the results or the outcome and then retrain your model. And the other uh, part of it, um, have you, for example, looked at uh, the accuracy of the data that you train your model on? Um, whether they are kind of just like coming from honest parties or they are kind of biased. Uh, because I remember you mentioned something about the meals that maybe people will not report everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you're talking about just like single person, okay, I'm cheating myself. But how about if you have set of parties and then any bias, maybe in just like few data points will bias the whole model. Uh, did you think in this direction, is it in your kind of future work map or what? That's a that's a great question, and it was a significant issue in uh, parts of this thesis. So, for example, you can imagine that if you have a uh, hundred thousand people trying to lose weight and then typing in what they eat, then they may not be entirely honest because it's very hard to lose weight, and you want yourself to succeed. And so, that's an example of a confounder present in all the data that we were working with. And one thing that we did to limit. Uh, the effects of that bias was to filter for active users. So from, say, a few hundred thousand users that we might have had data from, then we took the most active users, so people who reported every day in the hopes that that would remove some of the bias of people who might check in once in a while or may not be entirely honest, or the cognitive load of, say, uh, exactly reporting what you eat and then thinking about what you want to be eating or wish you were eating is too high to be to keep it up constantly. And so that's one example of, say, filtering for active users in the food recommendation task was one way of avoiding that problem. But I think more generally, it's very hard to diagnose and fix. So it took several months of, say, data cleaning for the food recommender task to get around this issue because it's very messy self-report data. Somebody might tell you they ate one thing, someone else might eat the same thing, but report it slightly differently or have spelling mistakes. So I think that's a great question. and. Making that easier for practitioners is a great topic for future work. Does anybody have any other questions? Hey, uh, I have a quick question. Um, so with the, the last method you showed, um, incorporating some of your physical knowledge into an optimization procedure, mm -hmm. I'm just curious how you think about that philosophically as a trade-off between, you know, could you build those physics directly into the loss function? And what is the difference between you're basically finding a suboptimal solution to the problem you've posed? Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a great point. And then that's... I think that's most interesting to think about in terms of difficulty of using these methods. So say if you work in statistical physics, then you might be really incentivized to spend a long time doing a lot of math to get every last bit of performance out of an approximation that you build to, say, a nicing model with complicated interactions. But if you want to study several such systems, then you have to think about the trade-off of how much more math do I want to do versus taking that hit in performance in exchange for having a general method, such as the higher covariational models that we saw. Even though we designed the convolutional kernel for the icing model, we got very good performance in a fully connected graphical model as well. 
And so I think that's where the interesting trade-offs come into hand is if you care about more than one system, that'll change your incentives of how much math you're willing to do to get every last bit of performance and customization. Or if you're willing to take the hidden performance, as you said, and then think of a more general method such as constraining, um, say, a one dimension of your optimization, which is the entropy between successive iterates. And that'll make it easier for you to study a wider variety of scientific problems. So I think it, I think it's a great question and I don't think there's the final word on it yet. Interesting. Thanks.